<laughs> so my talk today is about what I like to call the digital production gap, right? So rather than looking at digital inequality from, or the digital divide, which is more commonly used, from an access or use or consumption or even participation framework, I'm really looking at the production of online content, right? Who's creating blogs, websites, other social media, and what I find is that even among people that are already online, that there is indeed a class-based production gap here in the United States. But before I go any further, I'd like to ask who in this room knows who the Time Magazine Person of the Year was in 2006, way back, way back in 2006. Yes, you and you. And you, and probably, I would say, probably most every person in this room, might, maybe a few exceptions. Um, basically, they were honoring the whole Web 2.0 framework, right? That we're all participating in this new digital democracy, right? So rather than a one-to-many system of the traditional media, we have a new democratic marketplace of ideas, we have citizen journalists participating, everything we've talked about today with this new media public sphere, and a broader range of viewpoints. But I first want to look at what are we really comparing this to? What was going on with the traditional media in terms of the poor and working class in the United States, which is the focus of my research? And what we have in the past is that the poor and marginalized communities were often ignored, silenced, mediated, right? So what does that mean? We use the term media a lot, right? So with the poor and working class often, rather than interviewing a homeless person, you might interview a spokesperson for um, a, a homeless shelter, right? And often stereotyped or misrepresented were the poor. And the result of that and why that matters, which is important um, to academics and others as well, I'm sure, is what, so who cares? Why, why does this matter? And it matters because poly, policymakers ignore issues that aren't really present in the media. That's a, a big factor um, in how policy is made. So, but now we have the internet, right? Yay. So, our new superhero, the internet, and all of that will change, right? But the question today is whose voice is online, right? And as a social scientist, I want to conduct an empirical test of this claim of digital democ democracy and equality online. So first, though, one thing that we like to do in academia is compare what other academics have written, right? We have to look at that. So again, a lot of research has been done on consumption, right? And, and the whole concept of the public sphere, which we've talked about today, and private communication, email, et cetera, when we're looking at the online world, is usually kind of intermixed in a lot of digital divide or digital inequality research. <coughs> right, but if we're really gonna look at the public sphere, we wanna know who is producing online content for the public's consumption. Right, so how did I go about doing this? So, for any kind of statistical geeks here, um, I talk a little bit about my method on the slide. I won't get into a lot of details, but I basically looked at, um, Pew has done many, many, many surveys. I took 16 of those over a nine year period and taking into account, right, so when we do statistical analysis, we take into account race, gender. I'm not just looking at class, right? I'm taking into account a number of different factors if someone lives in a rural area or an urban area. And I really want to compare this relationship between class and production. So I looked at 10 production activities over time. And here are six of them, kind of the usual suspects, right? Blogging, making a video, posting videos, posting photos. And also, I wanted to look at some of these semi-public activities, right? So rather than looking at who's, you know, producing this really, you know, the Daily Cost or like a really famous um, blog, what about some of these more vernacular or everyday um, activities? I mean, there's been a lot of talk today about chat rooms or news groups, right? Many, many more people interact and read them than blogs. And also wanted to look at some of the evolving social media as well. So what did I come up with? Well, because I wanted to look at class, I wanted to um, 
develop a way to kind of quantify that. So I looked at education statistically for this data. This is the best way to do it. Um, and I wanted to set a high bar, right? So I could have looked at comparing college graduates with people who don't have a high school education, but um, that would kind of be an easy shot, right? Folks who <coughs> don't have a high school education probably aren't very literate and may not um, be posting much online because of that. I also wanted to go beyond a lot of the research in academia um, is on other college students because we're on a college campus and I really wanted to look at the general population. So as you can see here, um, this is the likelihood that someone will um, uh, uh, produce online content with these five uses. And just with the first one, you're twice as likely um, to post to a news group if you're a college graduate. Now again, these are people who are already online, right? We still have this digital divide based on access. That is, is slowly closing, but it's still, depending on the data, about 70%. Right, so here are five of the 10 uses. There's a clear education gap, but what about the other five? Is it, is it just that it's kind of half and half? Well, what we like to do is look at a lot of our variables. So I looked at um, location, where people are accessing the internet. And if you take location away from my data, education, there's an education gap for all of these activities. But what I'm finding is that education is really, I mean, I'm sorry, location is really significant for the likelihood that someone is going to produce online content. So if you have access, like probably most people here at home and at work and now with our mobile devices, that there's a higher likelihood that we're going to produce content, right? So to use the term of Karl Marx, right, um, controlling the means of production, right, we're much more likely to produce this content. So location is key for eight of our uses, eight of our activities. Also, we have frequency, right? How often do you go online, the surveys ask people, once, um, once every couple weeks, once a week, et cetera, all the way up to many times a day. And what's interesting is that, again, it would be clear if I compared people who are rarely online to people are going on at, online every day that the latter, people who are online all the time, are going to produce more content. But even if you care, compare people who are online once a day versus many times a day, there's a, a big gap. Twice as many people generally produce online content if they're on line many times a day. And you may say, well, what does that mean? Some people just don't want to. Well, if you really look at some ethnographic data, I did some qualitative research in a public library and found that for a lot of people who, who don't have regular access and who struggle to find online access at school, at home, I talked to this one woman, her name was Dawn, she um, was a young student and came to the library when it was open, right, libraries are being closed, maybe five days a week, if she could, she tried to use internet at school, and she could just do the basics. She was looking for jobs, she was doing her schoolwork, and she t talked a lot about wanting to be on MySpace more, but she just wasn't able, couldn't even afford a cell phone. So what we have, if we look at the data, is that class affects production, right? And our three variables that we talked about, education, location and frequency are all class-based proxies. There's another study I won't get into that kind of interrogated a little bit how many digital tools you have, how many gadgets. Think about how many gadgets you have. Um, and also the social work context, which is related to class as well. So just to summarize my research, I'm looking at who is producing online content for the public sphere. Right? A production versus a consumption lens. Clearly finding digital inequality rather than this ubiquitous um, digital democracy. And the inequality is, from, this, from these findings that I talked to you today, is about class. I'm also working on gender. There's also a big gender gap as well. And the other point, just to conclude with, is some of you may say, well, eventually everyone will get online. And, um, we'll start doing these kinds of activities, but by tracing um, a nine-year period and looking at these types of activities, that there's always an emerging technology, and it's very challenging in terms of resources and background and time and location, um, who is able to afford to um, produce online content. So I argue that this gap is persistent. Thank you.